Well, last week we looked at the creation with God right at the very beginning, God outside of creation, not in creation, although he enters into creation and reveals himself. We see humans being created in the image of God. And we saw that in Genesis 1 and 2, you see facts and information that is crucial to our understanding of the world and how the world works. In other words, it gives us a Christian, even a Judean, uh, worldview where God is outside of creation and everything comes from God. We saw how humans turned against God and tried to put themselves in the place of God with the fall. We see uh, a recurring pattern of sin, uh, of disobedience, of turning against God and we also see God's grace at work. So we see it through the flood, that eight people are saved through the flood. There is the promise uh, that is given to Noah and uh, the rainbow, which is the sign of the covenant made with Noah. And that covenant is very similar to the covenant of creation, the instructions that are given to Adam and Eve. The next thing is the, uh, the Tower of Babel, where people, again, disobedient. There's the arrogance of trying to reach God by their own efforts. And we see the languages confused and the scattering of people. We see uh, scattering is a sign or the results of sin. It's the curse of sin. Gathering is the blessing of God as he brings people together. From that uh, Genesis 1 to 11, a sort of prehistory, which is some of it seems to be lost to us. We're guessing at a, a lot of the references that are made in those chapters. But in chapter 12, we're looking at about 2000 BC, and Abraham comes onto the scene. He has the son Isaac. Isaac has the son Jacob. Abraham is very important for chapter 12, chapters 12, verses 1, 1 2, 2, or 3, where you've got the covenant made with Abraham, the promises that are then passed on to Isaac and passed on to Jacob and are ratified over and over again in the first chapters up to about chapter 17 and beyond um, in Genesis to these, uh, to these patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now uh, you remember the story of Jacob and Esau. Uh, Jacob becomes known as Israel. He has 12 sons, 12 children, who are the children of Israel. One of those children is Joseph. And we see the story of Joseph then right through all the chapters through to the end of Genesis, to Genesis chapter 50. Joseph, of course, finishes up in Egypt. The, uh, the family follow down to Egypt and settle there in the area of Goshen, near the Nile. And uh, there is slavery and there is persecution of the Hebrews as they uh, multiply in the, land, in the area of Goshen. They're in Goshen, they're partly in Goshen because uh, they're there because they are shepherds, and the Egyptians looked down on shepherds. So they were sort of shunted off into that area, and therefore didn't sort of integrate into the Egyptian society. They were always a separate people. Moses uh, is the one that God chooses when he hears the cries of the people in their slavery. He sends Moses to the Pharaoh to say, let my people go into the wilderness to worship me. The Pharaoh refuses. He uh, thinks that the God, Yahweh, the God of Israel, is not to be compared with his gods or even with him himself, as the Pharaoh was thought of as a god. And the plagues come to show that their gods are, uh, are, are, cannot do anything um, compared to Yahweh. Yahweh is more powerful than their gods. And so there's that series of of plagues that come upon Egypt to prove not only to the Egyptians and to the Pharaoh, but also to the Hebrews that this God, the God of Abraham, is truly at work through Moses, through Aaron. So we come to the, uh, the Pharaoh's been refusing to let the people go, and time and time again he's, uh, he's backed down, he said yes you can go, and then changed his mind. His heart has been hardened, he hardens his own heart, New Testament says he hardens his heart and God hardens his heart as well. Cooperates. There's a cooperative work going on. Well, the last plague then is the plague associated the death of the firstborn. And the Hebrews are told that 
they are on this particular night to kill a lamb and to use its blood they to eat have it sufficient meat for the whole family to eat and uh, as they kill this lamb they put the blood on the lintel and on the doorposts of the house and those inside the house are saved from the angel of death passing over Egypt they are saved by the blood of the lamb you remember that John the Baptist says of Jesus as he walks by behold the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world the blood of Jesus Christ that we remember in the uh, in the communion the blood of Christ okay so that night uh, incidentally, I should say that the, the Hebrews, living in the land of Goshen, seem to be preserved from the plagues. So once again, it's a demonstration to them, God is looking after them. And the angel of death passes over Egypt. The firstborn of all the families of Egypt die that night. It's a great tragedy, an avoidable one, but one that the Pharaoh brought on himself, despite the warnings. The Hebrews are safe inside. They have a meal, they sit down to, in fact they don't sit down, they stand up to eat the meal because they're in readiness to leave. So they stand up and they eat the meal and uh, they, they have other bits and pieces to do with the meal and this meal of course becomes the Passover. And the Passover from then on becomes the ritual feast that is celebrated each year and is still celebrated to this day that, uh, that um, Jewish people will sit down each year and have a Passover meal around the table and the father of the family usually will be the one who stands up and tells the story, tells the story of how God has delivered them from slavery and brought them out into the wilderness and brought them to the land of promise. So the story is retold and it's enshrined in the Passover feast, which eventually will become the Holy Communion feast because Jesus takes the same meal and takes the bread and the wine of that meal and invests it with new meaning. This is the new covenant, he says, of my blood, which is given for you. Partake of this, this is my blood. This is my body given for you. So the Passover becomes not just a part of Jewish history, but it's embedded in Christian history as well. And it becomes the great marker of deliverance. Deliverance through the blood of the Lamb and the faith put in the Word of God concerning it. So, the people uh, are finally let go. Pharaoh finally gives in and uh, they're, they're almost pushing them out of the door by this stage. The Egyptian people are so, so keen to get rid of them that they give them gold and, and stuff to help them on their way. Please get going. Take these things with you. Please don't come back again. And so they make their way out. And uh, they make their way down towards the Red Sea, or some people say the translation should be the Red Sea. There's the Nile Delta. Okay, and this goes around, up here is the promised land, there's, Mount Ga there's uh, Galilee, there's the Dead Sea somewhere around <coughs> there, and the Rift Valley sort of comes down here and comes down towards the Red Sea, on one arm of the Red Sea, and the other arm of the Red Sea comes up this way, and something like that. Okay, so they leave the land of Goshen around this area and they head down to the Red Sea. It might be north of there. If it's the Red Sea or the Reed Sea, it doesn't really matter. What happens is that the Pharaoh changes his mind. He sends the army after the Israelites with chariots and all the rest of it. You'd think he'd have learned by now, but he doesn't. And they catch, it, they catch up, or the Israelites can see them coming. And God says to Moses, stretch your staff out over the water. The waters part. Uh, the subject now of many cartoons. 
and uh, the, the waters, it says, are heaped up on either side. The Israelites go across on dry land. The Egyptians try to follow them, go down in, get, get bogged, and the waters come back and cover them, and they are all killed. There's no mention of this in the Egyptian archives, but then in those days you never advertised your defeats, you only talked about your victories. So there's no surprise in that. The people of Israel are now free, they're a nation. It says that about, it says in the Bible it talks about about a million people going out into the desert, which seems to be rather a big figure, it seems to be rather inflated. And some of the, some of the numbers that you find of the numbers of army people, uh, people fighting and so on, seem to be inflated too. There is the thought that there is a, there's, uh, that we don't really know, the, the word for a thousand can mean the leader of a thousand, and it may be inflated by, you know, a hundred or a thousand, when we look at some of the numbers. It may be hyperbole. People have often exaggerated the number. We do that ourselves, don't we? We say, uh, oh, look, you know, um, uh, I can give you uh, I can give you a million examples um, when uh, maybe we can only conjure up about five or six. Uh, so we we mean a lot. So there were a lot of people. Whether it was ten thousand, whether it was a million, there are a lot of people going out into the desert. And you can imagine that it needs a, a little bit of organising as it goes along. And there are various things that happen on the way. There's a battle that takes place. The, uh, the battle with the Amorites and the Amorites come against them and uh, they fight against the Amorites and as long as Moses' hands are kept up in the air they win and as he drops his hands they start to lose. I don't know why this is but you can imagine there's one person on either side holding his arms up to, uh, to make sure they win and they do. They win the day against the Amorites. God delivers them. It's quite obvious then it's not just the, the people who are winning the battle, but it is God who is winning the battle. He has given this through Moses. So there's the defeat of the Amorites, and as they go on their way, there's a place where the water uh, turns bitter, and they say, what are we going to drink? And God shows Moses a piece of wood, he throws the wood in the water, and somehow it becomes fresh water, and they're able to drink. There is time when they have no water, so they complain, and God tells Moses to, uh, to strike the rock and water comes from the rock. There are a couple of occasions that ha that happens on the way. Um, so this is happening too. And then they get, they, they say, we've got no food. What's, what are we going to do? And Moses speaks to God and God says, I'm going to send some food. And one morning the Israelites come out and there's all this flaky white stuff all over the ground. And um, they say, what is it? And in Hebrew, what is it? Is manna, is the word manna. So this manna is the food that becomes, and it's referenced in the New Testament, the food that Moses gave them in the wilderness, the manna. And if they, they could collect enough for the day, and they would put it in the jar, and they would take it back and they would have enough to eat during that day. The next day they would go out and collect again. The manna would be there on the ground and so on. Except for Friday. On Friday they collected a double amount and it would last over to Saturday as well. Friday sundown to Saturday sundown, the Sabbath day. So they didn't collect on the Sabbath day. If they tried to collect for two days at other times, the stuff went moldy. So no greed here. You're not going to make any money out of selling extra manna or anything like that. You have just enough. God gives you enough, not necessarily a surplus, although God is a God of surplus as well, as we've seen in His grace. Uh, the, the amount of, uh, of variety and all of those things shows a, a prodigal God, a wastrel God almost. He gives us more than we need. Um, and certainly there was more than enough manna for them to eat. But, with the manna, um, eating uh, cornflakes every day or whatever, um, can get a little bit boring sometimes. And they said, uh, we're fed up with this food, we want something else. 
And uh, they, they started to, the, uh, as they're going along, they're complaining. They're not just saying, oh, things are difficult. You know, let's go to God and ask him if he can make things a little easier. They're saying rather, and this comes across, let's go back to Egypt. We were better off back in Egypt. And they forget the slavery back here. They forget the conditions. They say, we want to go back to where there were leeks and garlics and all sorts of wonderful things like that. You know, all the things that children hate. Um, and they remembered all of these things and they were complaining that they wanted to turn around and go back into slavery. That was about it. Let's forget about God. Let's forget about his plans. Let's forget about this freedom. Let's go back and be slaves again. We were better off back there. Anyway, God sends uh, quails into the camp. These quails, whether they got blown off, off course or whatever it is, but suddenly they've got meat in the camp and they're able to eat once again. So we see this taking place on the way down to Mount Sinai. They are constantly provided for and they are constantly complaining. But when they get back down to, to Mount Sinai, chapter 19 of Genesis, God speaks to Moses and speaks, Moses speaks to the people. And the message is, if you will be my people, I will be your God. It's the words of another covenant. A covenant made to Abraham, go to where I will show you, and I will do this, this, and this for you. Now it's the, for the whole people. This is a covenant with the whole people. I have shown you who I am. I have brought you out of Egypt. I am the God who has given you what you need all the way down. My grace has been in evidence in your lives as you have traveled down to this place. Now, you've got all that evidence behind you. Now is the time to make a decision. Will I be your God? If you will, if I will, be, if you will uh, allow me to be your God, or you let me be your God, I, you will be my people, and I will continue to care for you, is the implication. I will continue to look after you. But, also, there is the stipulation of obedience. You will also obey me. And that comes into it as well. So here at Sinai, the people say, yes, we will. Yes, we will. They were in a good phase at that time. <laughs> Not looking back to Egypt so much, but they were looking ahead. On the way here, they, they're settled at Sinai. Moses goes up the mountain, and God gives him the Ten Commandments, the Ten Words, if you like. He comes down, you realize that the Ten Commandments are all relational things. The first being love to the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength, with all your might. And uh, the other commandments also have to do with relationships with others as well. So towards parents, towards your neighbor, um, all of these things, the, ten, the whole Ten Commandments, don't do this, don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't bear false witness, and so on. They all have to do with relational stuff. Here too, as the commandments are given, there are quite a number of different ones. And as we look forward uh, to the next books, we've had Genesis, you see. We're in Exodus. And the next book is Leviticus. And then Numbers. Now in those books, in particular, you will see uh, listed all sorts of commandments. Some of them are duplicated uh, from, from book to book, particularly from here, here, and here. You've got commandments. Uh, some of the commandments are commandments of a ritual nature. In other words, they are things like uh, you shall observe various feasts. The Passover was going to be one of them. That's in, enshrined in their history. So the ritual is feast like the Passover. There's the feast of Thanksgiving. There's the, the feast of tabernacles. So there's like a harvest festival, so to speak. So there are things that have to do with giving thanks to God. There's the Day of Atonement. This becomes a really important one because atonement has to do with sacrifice. You remember we mentioned about the blood of the Lamb. 
Well, the lamb becomes, in a sense, a symbol of sacrifice. What do you do with guilt? How do you atone for sin? How do you deal with a guilty conscience? How do you make the way right between God and people if you've got no way to deal with sin? We don't even talk about sin in society today, uh, but sin is very much a reality and it's in the hearts of people and we know the difference between good and bad. We know when we do the wrong thing, but how do we atone for it? Atonement has the idea of being made one with God and being brought back into relationship once again. So you've got to, if you break it down, at one month, being at one with God. And God provides the way. He says the way that these people could be in contact with God again was to make a sacrifice. Something had to die. There was blood to be shed for sin because sin is so serious and cuts us off from God. And so the ways of atonement was sometimes it was the blood of a bull, if you were wealthy enough, or a lamb, or if you couldn't afford it, it was something that could be a pigeon, could be a bird which, that was used instead. But the sacrifice was so important to be brought before God and it wasn't just that it was sacrificed and thrown away. The, the sacrifice was actually eaten, so it's not as if you know, God was just demanding that you, you throw animals away. Uh, there was, a, there was a, a, a price to be paid, and they were to realize the seriousness of the sin. And when they brought the sacrifice, they didn't just give it to the priest and say, sacrifice this for me. They had to kill the animal themselves. So that brought the seriousness of it to them as well. They actually had to take the life, and the life was atonement for them, brought them into relationship with God. It was an act of faith in many ways, because we know that um, the Bible says very clearly that the, uh, the blood of bulls and goats and so on can't bring you into fellowship with God on its own. It's the act of faith that, uh, that is instrumental in this. And also when we get to the New Testament, of course, Christ becomes the final sacrifice for sin. And this means of atonement, the animal sacrifice, is no longer necessary. Christ is the final one. Because only a human being can in fact die for human beings. You can't have a dog or a bull or, a, or, a, uh, or any animal. You can't have an animal dying for a human being. It just doesn't work. It has to be a human being. And it had to be a perfect human being, and that was Jesus. But that's later. Now, you had to have a way of doing all this. There had to be a certain amount of organization. So one of the things is that Moses is, uh, is approached by his father-in-law, Jethro. And Jethro comes to the camp, sees everything is, is going pretty well. They're getting organized, as they would certainly need to. And certainly the laws were helping them to do that, because it was not just ritual laws. It was also civil laws. In other words, what to do if somebody committed a crime. And at that time, it was something like an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Seems a bit rugged to us, perhaps, but in those days, it stopped the argument. Uh, somebody poked your eye out. Um, you were not allowed to poke their eye out, but the judiciary, the people in charge, the authorities, could poke that person's eye out on your behalf. And then it was settled. You've lost an eye, they've lost an eye. And it saved you from the sort of thing where you poke his eye out, he pokes your eye out, and then you poke his other eye out because you're, you're still angry about it. And then uh, he pokes your other eye out. And so it goes on, round and round. And it gets worse and worse. And of course, this is where uh, payback comes in. Um, the, uh, the word for it is lex talionis, it's the, it's the law of retribution. And it worked well when authorities were involved because it settled the matter, it's over, it's done with. And when you look a lot at those laws, some of them seem fairly draconian to us, uh, who have our judicial systems and our law systems and our laws of, you know, our, our courts of appeal and prisons to put people in and all of that sort of stuff. There was none of that out in the, in the wilderness. 
They needed law to get themselves organized and to get a judicial system going and to get the whole thing, uh, things settled properly. So there was ritual law, there was civil law, there was also moral law as well. Uh, and these, the moral law is based basically, basically on the nature of God. When you think about the creation and the order of creation, then moral law, or immorality if you like, is something that steps outside of the created order. It's against the nature of God. Now we have all sorts of other ways of defining morality, but that's basically what it is. That's basically what it boils down to in a Christian worldview. The things that are against the nature of God. So you've got these three aspects of law, and you get them a lot mixed up together. So when you look at the various laws that are given, uh, some people will say, oh well, you know, you've got this law about morality and this law about civil law and this law about how you deal with, with leprous conditions and this law about mold in the house and so on. But they all have different functions. They're all different categories of law when you look at them more closely. Now, of course, you could imagine that Moses, the leader, uh, everybody was coming to Moses uh, to have things settled. He was the court of appeal. Uh, you can imagine he would be run off his feet, which he was. So when Jethro, his father-in-law, comes to him, which is what I'm getting back to now, when Jethro comes to him, Jethro says, this is all very wonderful, but you're going to kill yourself doing this. Appoint, uh, appoint people to do the job of delegate your responsibilities. So here's the first example, if you like, or a good example of delegation. And so Moses appoints these people who can look after the everyday stuff of people coming and wanting their, their, their laws to be settled. And uh, he says, as they come with their everyday stuff, if there's something that's really important, then they can come to you, they can appeal to you, and you can deal with that as well. Over some of the big stuff that you need final arbitration over. So this is the way things started to be organized. As I say, you'll find some of this stuff in each of these books. Um, one of the biggest things, of course, is the, this thing about atonement. Uh, you had to have some way of actually carrying all of this out. And so in the middle of the camp, they had a tent. This was given the dimensions of the tent and the materials to be used in the tent were all part of God's plan. And this tent had outer walls which were made of skins and it was like a thin wall all the way around. But it was at the very center of the tent. This became known as the tabernacle. The tabernacle is a dwelling place. And in the entrance to the tabernacle, around about here, was the place of sacrifice. It was a, like a stone table of sacrifice. There was a laver here where the, the pot for washing. And then behind that was another tent, an enclosed tent this time. And this enclosed tent had inside it quite a few things. There were lamps, there was showbread, there was piece, uh, loaves of bread, if you like, to represent the 12 tribes of Israel. And the first, first part of this tent was the holy place. And then into the holy place, the priests could go. Who were the priests? Well, they were the descendants of Levi. And they become known as the Levites. The Levites were the, were the priests. And one of those priests was Aaron. Sometimes they call it the Aaronic priesthood. Aaron was the, was the priest. So the Levites were the ones who would operate in the tabernacle in the Holy of They could go into the Holy of Holies. Um, but between the Holy and Holies, uh, Holies and the back part, there was a curtain. 
And behind that curtain was like a cube. It was a cube-shaped area. And in that cube-shaped area, it was known as the Holy of Holies. So you've got the holy place and the Holy of Holies, a special place set aside. And in that Holy of Holies was the Ark of the Covenant. Not to be confused with Noah's Ark, of course. <coughs> but the Ark of the Covenant was a box. It was a box something like this. <coughs> and it had uh, rings on the side so you could put things through to carry it because it needed to be carried from place to place. And only the Levites could carry it. Very special. On top of it, it had angels. And it's, when you look at it, it looks something then like a throne. And there's a sense in which this becomes the very place that God dwells in the Holy of Holies, at the holy place. This is the Ark of the Covenant and this is the mercy seat, and it is the place of atonement. The blood is taken from the altar. Blood is splashed on the altar. It's taken into, on the day of atonement, it's taken in and splashed on the ark. To the people, to God, bringing God and people together through the mediators, the priests, through the high priest once a year. Only the high priest could go into the Holy of Holies, only once a year. This is certainly later on when the te temple is built. And I believe that they used to tie a rope around the high priest's leg. And he went, it went into the Holy of Holies. If he died in there from a heart attack or something, there was no way that anyone was going to go in there after him. So they would drag him out by this rope. They were prepared for anything, you see. Um, but you see the seriousness with which they took this, mm -hmm. the holiness of the, the actual ark itself, and the awe in which they held God himself. So at the center of the camp, and it was at the center, because part of the organization was that the, uh, the tents of some of the tribes were set, three of the tribes were set up around here, three of them around here, three around here, and three around here. So the ark, the ark and the tabernacle were at the very center of the camp. And there was a cloud over it to show that God was at home, so to speak. Now we know, of course, that God is not limited to the tabernacle. But here was a really powerful reminder that God was at the present, was present in the very center amongst his people. And as they traveled through the wilderness, as they uh, broke camp, they would pack all this up. The Levites would carry the Ark of the Covenant. Nobody else would touch it, go near it even. And uh, they would carry on on their journey. And let's just talk a little bit about the book of Leviticus, because it's part of this whole law thing. And you've got a lot of details about laws. And a lot of the laws are, cover these things, the ritual, the civil, the moral uh, aspects of law. And uh, the subject of Leviticus is not just that it's a law book, but it's actually a book about holiness. And holiness has two aspects to it. It's not a popular word these days. Mm -hmm. It's not popular at any level not amongst Christians or non-Christians for that matter, but holiness is a tremendously important concept, idea. Holiness has two aspects to it. One is that things are holy if they are set aside for a purpose. So you can set aside objects for holy use. And the holiness, of course, has to do with objects being set aside for use for worship of God. So you had objects, you had places, you had the tabernacle itself, all of these things, the holy place, the holy of holies, the objects within it, all had this aspect of holiness about them because they're set aside for the holiness of God. The people themselves were holy. 
and these the people of God, the Israelites, were set aside. God says, out of all the nations of the earth, you're just another of the nations, but out of all the nations of the earth, I have chosen you to be a holy nation, a priesthood, and a holy nation. Now, it wasn't that every person in Israel was a priest, but they had the function of mediating, if you like, God to the whole world. The priesthood would, the priesthood would, would be a go between between God and people. So God would speak to the priests or the or to Moses, and Moses would speak to the people, and the people would speak to Moses, and Moses would speak to God. So Moses was the mediator. The priests were the mediators, as far as the sacrificial system went. And uh, the priests had a, a tremendously important function. But the whole people had a function in showing to the world what it was like to live under God. A theocracy with God in control. Not with a person in control, but with God in control. Yes, Moses was a leader. He, it was under Moses. But Moses was very much under God. It was God who was in charge. It was a theocracy. And so you have... Um, Leviticus with the idea of holiness that these are people who are set aside for God they are very special but also holiness has another aspect to it and that is the idea of purity God is completely faithful he is completely loving he is completely good he is completely everything that is that is uh, is amazing and, and, and good and right God is just so God is holy in that sense. He is holy in everything that he does. He is holy in all his decisions. He is holy in his very nature. It's not that he behaves in a holy way. He is holy. He is holiness. Uh, he is the very essence of what it is to be holy. Uh, so that when we uh, try to do the right things, we are trying to emulate the holiness of God, the moral holiness above all we're trying to behave the way God would how he behaves towards other people how he even behaves towards his enemies and those who have turned their back on him God is patient his loving kindness is on show right through the Bible even to this point so the holiness of God is reflected in the laws of Leviticus and there are food laws now when you look at the food laws, it's very easy to, uh, to wonder uh, what's going on here with these foods. Why are pigs unclean and uh, these other animals are okay to eat? You can eat a bull, you can, you can uh, eat all sorts of other animals, but these ones with cloven hooves you're not to touch. And there are certain birds that are unclean and others are okay. Certain fish you can't eat, but others seem to be all right. What's the difference between them? And in some cases, there may be some, there may be some hygienic things involved, but I think the main reason is that there isn't a particular reason why one animal should be chosen over another, except that it showed you that there was a difference between the clean and the unclean. And when you had one animal and not another, it was reminding you that you were special too that you were a special people, that you're a holy people, and even in the things you eat, you delineate between what is designated as holy, what is useful, and what is unclean, what is clean and what is unclean. So the whole of the, whole of, um, the Hebrew life, um, from the things that they ate to the, uh, to the ways that they sacrificed, to the to the feasts that they held, everything that they did, all the laws that they observed were to remind them that they were a holy people set aside for God and they had a specific purpose in the world. From the covenant to Abraham, that they were not only blessed by God, but they were to be a blessing to the whole world. And so they had this, uh, they had this, um, these laws that helped them to do that. There was another one too, and that is that in the camp they had uh, people going around in the camp. 
who men who grew their hair long and they wouldn't have any alcohol and uh, there were various other things that they observed as well and these people when you looked at them you think that's a bit different. Maybe we wouldn't today because there's so many, particularly if you wander around in parts of Sydney, um, you, you'd think, well, that's, that's not so very different. But in the camp, that was very different. And when they, uh, they saw these people, they would be reminded by these people that they were a different people too. They weren't just like everybody else, but they had a specific function in the world. These people were called Nazarites. And some famous Nazarites are Samson and John the Baptist. But there are others as well. So these Nazarites, they took on a vow. And that vow meant that they grew their hair long. They were a visual aid, a visual reminder. Uh, just as the, the feasts and so on were also visual reminders of God with them, just as the tabernacle was a visual reminder that God was in the middle of their, their whole life, not just their worship on the Sabbath day, but their whole life every day of the week was, was governed by Yahweh, the God who had delivered them. You will be my people and I will be your God. And these laws that we see coming through in these books in particular um, emphasize all of that. I think we'll take, uh, we, actually I'll go a little bit further, I was going to take a break, but I think we'll go a little bit further than that. As you go from uh, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, you see that there is a progression, a gradual progression uh, towards the land of Canaan up here. They're moving in this direction. After Sinai, they break camp. Well, there's that, um, there's the I should mention the, uh, the particular case, of course, where Moses comes down from the mountain and um, that he finds that, that he's been away for so long that the people uh, have lost, um, lost faith in him. They believe that he's, he's gone missing and uh, he's not coming back again. Um, and they turn to Aaron and say, uh, uh, come on, you know, what, what's, we, we've got to do something. There. He's gone. We, we, you know, we're going to die here. It's all over. The sky's falling. Um, and Aaron gets them to bring their gold. And they make a golden calf. And Aaron said, here is your God who brought you out of Egypt. So here's something to worship. There's something to, to get your attention, if you like. You can, you can focus your attention on this while Moses isn't here. Mm -hmm. Moses comes back, of course, and uh, finds the, the golden calf there. Uh, asked Aaron what he's done. Oh, the people, they, uh, they put pressure on me and uh, I got all the gold together and we threw it into the fire and out came this golden calf. Oh. <laughs> like magic. You know, I had nothing to do with it. It was just, it just happened. Anyway, there's, there's a severe penalty. You can read all about it yourself, but there's a severe penalty. And there were severe penalties in those days. Mm -hmm. You think of a, you know, even if it's only 10,000 people out in the wilderness, you think of 10,000 people with no rules or regulations, with no, no prisons or anything like that. Then the, the, uh, the ways of dealing with these th people had to be pretty severe because you've got a fledgling nation that has a destiny which is bigger than anything else that any other nation has greater destiny, a greater purpose in life. You had to make sure that people got it right, right at the beginning and they realized the seriousness of turning against God. Anyway, that starts with the, the break camp. Uh, you get this in numbers in particular, you see the, they start to progress towards the land. And as they progress towards the land, they send spies up into the land. And as they spend spies, 12 spies into the land, one from each tribe, uh, to, to spy out to see whether they can go and attack the land straight away. And the spies come back and uh, 10 of the spies say, oh, there are giants in the land, the great walled cities, we're never going to be able to take it. It's absolutely hopeless. 
Um, two of them, Joshua and Caleb, they say, we can take the land. God is with us. We'll be able to take it. And nobody was listening to Joshua and Caleb. We're all going to die in the wilderness. We don't stand a chance. Now, why have you brought us out here to die in the desert? And their lack of faith meant that they didn't see the land. They didn't get to the land. And God says to them, the people who have rejected God and rebelled against God at this stage will die in the wilderness. They're not ready. They will die in the wilderness. It will be their children. It will be the next generation that will actually get into the land. And so they start on a journey of uh, 40 years. Uh, as it's designated in the Bible, for 40 years they wander around in the, in the desert while that generation uh, dies out. And you get a new, a hardened generation, a younger generation. There's only Joshua and Caleb who actually get to see the land. Even Moses didn't get to see the land. We'll talk about that later. But uh, Joshua and Caleb got to see it. But on their journeys, there are other things that happen on the way. There's more complaining that takes place. Uh, on one case, they're wanting to go back to Egypt still. And um, God sends amongst them snakes, and the snakes start to bite them. Uh, they, they're dying, and uh, Moses appeals to God. God says, put up a stake. And on that stake, he says, put a serpent on the snake. Anybody who looks at the serpent, if they've been bitten, once they've been bitten, if they look at the serpent, they will be saved. It's the symbol, the doctor's symbol today. You see it on doctor's cars. And that symbol, of course, is taken up. The, the people, as they looked to the snake, they were okay. And so lives were saved. And of course, Jesus takes that image and says, just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man, that is Jesus himself, be lifted up so that all who look to him will be saved. Jesus becomes the symbol of the one who is lifted up and the means of salvation. The, uh, the journey continues and it comes around this way. And we'll leave it just at that point and I'll talk a little bit more about how they get towards the land after that. We'll take a break just now. Okay, so we've got the people of Israel, children of Israel, led by Moses, are making their way up now from the desert and they're getting closer to the promised land. Instead of going in this way, they come in where they would find some opposition. They come in around the back door, so to speak, and they're going to cross across the Jordan River. They want to go up through Edom to begin with, um, but the Edomites say, no way, you're not coming through here. Mm. Uh, and the reason for that was that the, well, the reason they didn't just go through there and wipe them out, which I guess they could have done, they could have just made war on Edom and uh, fought against them, but they didn't. They decided they would go around. In fact, God says go around them, because Edom actually are the descendants of Esau. Mm -hmm. And Esau was Jacob's brother, so there's a sense in which they were related. Um, so even Edom, in a sense, is protected by God. So they come around this way, and they're going to go through Moab. And they promised, they said to the Moabites, we, we want to go through here, we won't divert off the path to the right or the left, we'll just go straight through, we won't harm you, we've got no quarrel with you. But uh, they weren't going to have any of that. The, uh, the king, Barak, um, is very worried about all these people coming through, and the people were terrified as well. Uh, they, the Israelites were getting something of a reputation for winning battles. And Barak uh, calls on one of their prophets, a guy called Balaam, and says, uh, Balaam, I want you to I think that's the way you spell it, or is it the other way around? B-A-L-A-A. I think it might be the other way. Anyway, either way, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Balaam uh, is conscripted by Barak, and he says, I want you to curse these people of Israel. Mm. And uh, Balaam has some, uh, 
some nous and some contact with God. And he says, I can't, uh, I can't, you know, if God says not to curse them, I, he says, I can't curse them if God's not cursing them. I've got to do what, uh, whatever I'm told to do, whatever is revealed to me. Um, anyway, Balaam eventually goes to Barak, he eventually uh, gives in to him and he goes, but instead of cursing him, he blesses them. He blesses the Israelites. Um, Barak's furious, says, what are you doing? You know, I, I, I'm paying you to, uh, to curse these people. Anyway, um, there's the story, there's that rather cute story of um, Balaam and the donkey. Um, Balaam's on his way once again to, to curse and the angel is blocking the way. The donkey can see the angel, but the, um, uh, Balaam, for all his insight and understanding, can't. And uh, the donkey, he starts to beat the donkey, and the donkey says, you know, here, I've served you all this time, it starts to speak, and uh, here's the way you treat me. Anyway, uh, Balaam finishes up blessing Israel over and over again. And so Israel makes its way through. The, there is war against, uh, there is a battle with, uh, with Moab, or with the kings on this side, there is Sihon, and the king of the Amorites, I think it is. There's Og, uh, another king. And they come out against the Israelites as well. They fight against the Israelites, and they are defeated on this side of the on this side of the Jordan. And they come to the Jordan River. And there's a mountain here called Mount Nebo. And uh, on Mount Nebo, Moses sits down a new generation of people, the generation that has grown up in the wilderness. And he says to them, uh, I want you to remember where you've come from. And he tells them the story of how they came out of Egypt, of the places they went to on the way. And it's fairly detailed. There is fair detail of the journey they actually took through the wilderness, the places they stayed, and then how they broke camp. They stayed at the next place and broke camp, and so on. There isn't, as far as I know, any archaeological evidence for this for these different places. But it may be a that they may be looking at the wrong time because there are a couple of datings for the Exodus. There's an earlier one, around 1300, 1400 BC, um, which uh, seems to go well with the Bible account. And there's a later date, which archaeologists work with generally. Um, so they may be looking in the wrong time frame. The other thing is, of course, that when you go through the desert, the desert has a way of co covering up things very quickly. I remember reading about a um, uh, the Six Day War, and there was a piece of machinery, of a jeep or something, that was discovered buried under 10 meters of, of sand. Um, so things get buried very, very quickly and things move around a lot. So no particular evidence, but that doesn't mean to say that things won't be discovered in the future. Anyway, here they are at Nebo. Nebo. Moses is telling them where they've come from, but he also tells them again uh, the commandments. So here you are. These are the commandments again for a new generation. And this becomes then the book of Deuteronomy. Deutero, meaning second. Nomi, from the idea of nomos, word, the second word. The second telling of the Ten Commandments and the other commands as well. So Moses gives them instruction. Joshua is appointed as the, uh, as the leader to uh, come after Moses. And those five books then, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy form what we call the Pentateuch five books. They are traditionally called the books of Moses, um, thought to be the revelation of God to Moses about the beginnings, the beginnings of time, Genesis and so on, beginnings of time but also the history that's been handed down. Um, 
Others point to the fact that there seems to be a lot of editing going on in it, and uh, that within those five books there is editing. Whichever is, is true, the, and it may be both <coughs> that are true, um, there is the story of Moses' death, which he obviously didn't write about himself, um, but has been included, has it been included later. Either way, the books come down to us and are treated by Hebrew Jewish people as being God given, and we as Christians believe they are God given in the form that we have finally received them, whether they've been edited along the way. The final form gives us so much information and the story hangs together so well. The more you study it, the more you realize how well the story hangs together. So the Pentateuch then brings us to the edge of the promised land. Moses dies on Mount Nebo. He doesn't get to go in there. He had been disobedient to God when he struck the rock. And uh, his arrogance, his overconfidence at that time disqualified him from going in. He was an old man at the time, but it's Joshua who goes across the Jordan. And just like the, the uh, dividing of the Red Sea, um, Joshua gets the people to walk into the Jordan. As, as the priests walk into the Jordan, I think it's with the Ark of the Covenant, mm -hmm. it says the waters above dry up. Uh, people have pointed out that the waters of the Jordan do dry up upstream. It's in a rift valley. There are earthquakes that uh, frequently the landslides into the river. It gets dammed up for a while and then the water breaks through again. Uh, and this could have happened. But the main thing is that it happened at this particular time. As they, as they stepped into the water, the water dries up, they're able to walk through on relatively, anyway, dry land, and they start into the promised land. They've stepped into the promised land. They've put a heap of stones on the, uh, on the other side to show where they crossed as a memorial for where God has brought them to. So every time they went past that heap of stones, you know, somebody would say, what's that heap of stones? Well, this was the time when God brought us across the Jordan and into the land and so on. So you're constantly, you're making these little cairns of stones as reminders, as memorials of what God does. And when you think about it, through history, we do the same thing, don't we? We set up memorials to remind us of what has happened, of, of the deeds that people have done before us. And particularly for us Christians, we have things that we remember uh, that God has done in our lives. Good to keep a notebook, isn't it, as Christians, of the things that God does. And uh, that hymn, Count Your Blessings, name them one by one, it will surprise you what the Lord has done. It's good to remember what God's done. <coughs> they move into the land, and as they cross the Jordan, the first place they go to is Jericho. And... Uh, in Jericho, they send in some spies. Jericho has large walls. Uh, Jericho has been identified, of course. Uh, well, we think it's been identified. Um, it has large walls, and um, the spies are sent into Jericho. Uh, the spies finish up. Uh, I don't know whether they were going there in the first place, but they finish up in the, uh, the house of Rahab, the prostitute which is built into the wall of the, uh, built into the wall of Jericho. <coughs> People seem to have found out that they're in there, that the spies have come in, somebody's noticed somebody different walking through the gates, and uh, they are searching for the spies. Rahab realizes that these people are going to win. She has an inkling that God is going to give them the victory. And she says to the spies, I will hide you um, but remember me, save, save us. So she leaves a, a marker, a cord, in the window, a red one, as it happens, a reminder of blood. Um, and she leaves the cord in the window so that when the collapse of Jericho comes about, she and her family within there will be saved. And God gives instructions, march around, Keep marching around every day. On the seventh day, uh, sixth day or seventh day, march around seven times. And at the end of it, 
blow your trumpets. There must have been one, they must have been watching from the walls, watching them go round. <laughs> and they go round again. <laughs> they keep going round. And then blow the trumpets, shout, and the walls will come, will flatten down. Once again, the people point out it's very close, it's on the edge of the Rift Valley, the earthquake region. But again, it's the timing, isn't it? It happens just at that moment. It collapses, it falls down, and the uh, Jericho is wiped out. Everybody is wiped out. I must make a comment on this because you will see that uh, the command is given constantly to wipe everything out. The men, the women, the children. And in this case, not to take any booty for themselves, not to take any of the treasure for themselves, they're not to keep it. This is not a raiding party for them to profit from. It is judgment on the land. And it's very clear that um, God speaks to the people and says, I'm not giving you this land because you're particularly good. They've not really been that good anyway in the wilderness. But I'm giving you this land because of the evil of the land of the people who are in there. God is using these people to bring judgment, his judgment on a very evil people. It's difficult for us to imagine, particularly in this day and age, just how evil people can be. Mm -hmm. We see the news of Ukraine and we think it's pretty terrible the way that's carried on. The way the war is conducted in Ukraine is quite civilised compared with warfare in those days and the way of life in those days and the cheapness of life in those days. We'll get a glimpse of that in a moment in Judges. So the, the city is destroyed. Only Rahab survives. Rahab, by the way, is mentioned in Matthew's Gospel, in the genealogy at the beginning. She's an ancestor of Jesus. Isn't that remarkable? And then they go from there, they go to Ai. And Ai. <coughs> At AI, they're defeated. They don't know what's going on. They realize, eventually, through revelation, they realize that this guy called Achan, who has kept some of the booty from Jericho and has buried it in his tent under the ground. And again, severe justice. But Achan and his family are all wiped out. And it's an act of God ground swallows them up. They are then victorious over AI, the tactics work this time, and then the kings of the south, and remember when we're looking at this, this isn't just one nation, this is a whole lot of little nation cities with their own king in the city. Uh, they're not all that big, but they come together, the kings of the south come together to fight against the Israelites and they are defeated. So there's a southern campaign, and then the kings of the north do the same sort of thing, and they come against Israel, Israel fights against them, and there's a northern campaign, and at the end of that campaign, in the book of Joshua, the land is taken. It's not completely taken, because they didn't completely get rid of the inhabitants of the land. And those people would be a thorn in their side ever after because their idolatry and the ways of life would continue to infiltrate Israelite life ever after. At the end of Joshua, Joshua chapter 24, uh, Joshua once again gets the, gathers the people together and he says, this is what God has done for you. This is the division of the land. Uh, you find that... Uh, over here, there is Manasseh. They made a deal to have um, an area outside of the land. Across, that's one of jo uh, Joseph's sons. Ephraim has a major area in here. That's why sometimes the northern Israel, later on is called, is referred to as Ephraim, because it had a fairly large area in there. Uh, Judah was down here, <coughs> down in this area down south in the area around Jerusalem, but that's a later thing. 
and uh, the other tribes are scattered around. The Danites were sort of down here. They come into the picture a little later as not having any land. Um, so, and the one that seems to be missing, you, you, when you look at it, you think you've got two sons of, of Joseph, she should have 13 tribes. But of course there's one tribe that doesn't get an area to itself, and that is the Levites. Why don't they get an area? Because they're the priests. <coughs> and they need to minister to the whole of the people of Israel. So the Levites are spread throughout all the other tribes, and they have their own pieces of land and so on, but they are able to, uh, to minister to, um, to the different tribes, but they don't have, they don't have a, an area that's designated to them as the other street. So, um, so Joshua sits them down and says, here's what God's given you. You're settled in, you're going to settle in the land. He says, now you've got to choose. You've, you've got the way ahead. You've got, you've got to choose now who you're going to serve. Are you going to serve the gods who your ancestors served beyond the river, the river Euphrates? Or will you serve the gods, the God who brought you out of Egypt, the God who delivered you and the God who brought you to this land? And Joseph gives the challenge. Choose this day whom you will serve. But as for me and my house, says Joshua, we will serve the Lord. We will serve Yahweh God. And they go off, they settle in their own areas, and they become a sort of loose confederacy of tribes, and what we, of course, call a theocracy. They are under God, and insofar as there's any organization, it's organization that has been given through the law, through the commandments, and through the those um, uh, laws that have been handed down through the, through the Pentateuch. And they would be kept on track, the idea is they would be kept on track by the Levites. There's also, um, while I'm here, mentioned uh, throughout the land are six cities, cities of refuge. Uh, if you kill somebody accidentally, uh, the normal thing would be for one of your family to come kill you, basically, take revenge on you. If you had killed somebody accidentally, you could flee to the nearest um, city of refuge, which is why they were spaced out throughout the land. You could flee there, and you would be safe from the avenger. Um, there would still be, you'd still be tried to make sure that you, know, you, really, were, um, you really were innocent of murder. It was just manslaughter. But nevertheless, you would be safe while you were in the halls of that city, as long as you stayed there. So once again, there's a picture of salvation, and going through the gate, and all of that sort of thing, which comes into the imagery of scripture on the line of salvation. So the cities of refuge um, were also a feature of the land. End of uh, Joshua then, the book of Joshua. And we go, then go into the period of the judges. This is a sad and sorry and bloodthirsty time. Uh, in the time of the judges, uh, Israel once again was a, a loosely lit, uh, knit confederacy of tribes. But uh, during this time, uh, under, under God, they found that they started to drift away from God. And so there is a pattern that occurs during the time of the judges, and that is that the people started to turn away from God. They turn away, and because of that, God judges them. And this judgment involves neighboring tribes coming in and attacking them and making life difficult for them. And as the neighboring tribes attacked them, made life difficult for them, they would cry out to God. And as they cried out to God, God <coughs> heard them and raised up a judge. I'll put judgment so you know, I get confused with the judge. 
raised up a judge, and the judges were charismatic, with a small c, leaders who could inspire people, could bring people together. And they would, they would work on the tribes and get, sometimes not, not all the tribes necessarily, but a few of the tribes, they get a few of the tribes together, they would unite them against the enemy. So it was different people at different times, but this pattern went on. So they would, they would uh, the judge would lead the tribes, they'd defeat the enemy, they'd have eight years, 20 years, 80 years of peace. And then they would start to drift away again into idolatry. And as they <coughs> drifted into the idolatry of the peoples around them, God again brought another nation against them, another local tribe against them. They cry out to God, God would raise up a judge again, and then the whole thing would it just kept going around in circles. So the story of judges is this circle going around and around and around and around again. So you have judges who are raised up, notable ones. There's uh, Ehud, the left-hander. That's important. Lovely bloodthirsty story for you to go to bed on. Um, story of Ehud and his sword on the right side instead of the left side. Read all about it. There's uh, people like Gideon, perhaps, or let's take Deborah first. Deborah was a prophetess, and uh, she gets a message. She, she would probably judge between people that would come to her for wisdom and so on. She'd sit under a tree probably somewhere. They would come to her, she would dispense wisdom to them, and so on. One day she gets a vision, and it's to send off to the guy called uh, the guy called Barak. Um, she says, uh, "Barak, you're to go against our enemies, to lead against the enemies." Barak says, "I'm not going to go against the enemies unless you come as well." And she says, "Okay, very well. Uh, I'll go with you, but you won't get any of the glory." And in fact, Sisera, the general. Um, will be killed, not by you, you won't get any of the glory for that, it will be, he'll be killed by a woman. Um, and so they go off to war, There's, uh, God shows his hand in that Sisera and his people have uh, chariots, and uh, down in the valley it starts to rain, it doesn't just rain, it pours down, it's like Lismore. Um, and uh, the, the, the chariots get bogged. Chariots are not much use unless you've got dry ground and flat ground for that matter. Um, so they get really bogged down and Barak and his army are able to defeat them. Sisera gets away, he runs away, he goes and finds a tent somewhere, somebody living in the tent, Jael, and she uh, takes him in, she feeds him and uh, He's exhausted, he goes to sleep, and she nails his head to the ground with a pen, pen to peg. Lovely. Nice. nice. Well done. But that's, if it sounds pretty gory, it's, um, it's a feature of judges. This is the way things happen in judges. Uh, you've got Gideon comes on the scene. Now Gideon, uh, is a bit of a lad, I think. He's, uh, he pulls down the temple, the uh, statue to Baal in the uh, downtown, in his nearest town, and uh, gets all the locals up in arms about it. He's a, they think he's a bit of a, a hoodlum. Uh, but it's Gideon they turn to against the Midianites. And uh, Gideon is uh, a charismatic Figure, and he's able to draw a, an army, it says, of 22,000. When the 22,000 come along, um, God says to Gideon, you've got too many people. He says, I want you to cut it down from 22,000. Just speak to the people and say, look, you, you really didn't want to come to fight. You're only here because you feel you have to. Uh, you can go home. Uh, and so quite a lot of them went home. There were only uh, 10,000 left. Uh, so 12,000 leave, 10,000 left, 
Uh, if God says you've still got too many, if you go to war with these people, you think you've done it all yourself, I want you to know that I'm going to deliver you, not your big army. And so he says, take them down to the, to the stream or to the river, watch how they drink from the river, and those who cupped up the water, they could stay, and those who lapped it, got right down and lapped it up, and they were sent home. And Gideon finished up with, from 22,000, he had 300 men left. With those 300 men, he was going to go against the Midianites. Now, there's a stage at which Gideon speaks to God and says, look, you know, he was a reluctant starter, but um, he speaks to God. And he says, look, God, I want you to show me whether this is the right thing to do, you know, whether you're really with me. Give me a sign, God. And so he takes a fleece, and I can't remember which way around it is the first time, but he takes the fleece, he says, God, give me this sign. If I put the fleece down on the ground, and next morning there is dew on the fleece, and the ground is dry, then I will know that you're really with me in all this. And so the next morning, sure enough, there's, there's dew on the fleece, and the ground is dry. And Gideon says, oh, thank you. Uh, can we just do this again the other way around, just to make sure? Um, and if we, you know, if there's, there's dew on the ground and not on the fleece, um, I'll know that, you know, doubly sure. And so God does that for him as well. So when, when you hear about people saying, put out a fleece, that's what they're talking about. You put out some sort of uh, thing that, for God to show you what to do. It's probably not the greatest sign of faith, to do that, but nevertheless, God still shows Gideon um, that this is really the, the track that he wants him to go down. Anyway, Gideon uh, surrounds the Midianite camp during the night. They actually go into the camp and they hear them talking, and uh, as they, they hear them talking, they, these Midianites are really worried about the Israelites, and they realize that God has indeed given the Midianites into their hands. But they go back and they, they carry out the instructions that God has given them. They take these pictures with torches in them, not the ever-ready kind, but the uh, obviously fire torches. Um, and uh, they keep them hidden. And they've got trumpets. And at the given, uh, given sign, they break the jars. They wave the torches around in the air, so there's all this fire suddenly around the camp. They shout and they blow the trumpets and you can imagine in the middle of the night all these Midianites who are sleeping really soundly and thinking that uh, they've got the upper hand, suddenly uh, they think they're surrounded. They're thrown into confusion and in the semi-darkness they go around and they're killing each other. Um, they, uh, they, it comes to the stage where <coughs> eventually uh, God uh, gives them the victory over the Midianites. They, they flee and the Israelites go after them and finish them off. So it is that Gideon is able to deliver them through what God has done, not through what Gideon does. And they want to make him king. And he says, no. He says, I won't be king. He says, it is God who is your king. This is a theocracy, not a monarchy. And he refuses the, the kingship. His son, Abimelech, um, does try to take over the kingship. He tries, makes himself a king for a short time, but he doesn't last very long. And uh, there's a little bit about that in Judges as well. There are other judges, but amongst them is, the, uh, is Samson, who was a Nazarite. Nazarite. Hence, the thing about the long hair. His strength wasn't, of course, because in the hair itself, but it was in the vow that he had taken to God. That God had given him strength because he was a Nazarite. When he got his hair cut, he broke his vow. So you've got the, uh, the story of Delilah, who was actually a Philistine. You really get the impression that um, Samson didn't have very much on top of it, apart from his hair. Um, he didn't have much, much else going for him. And not only does he marry one of, the, one of the enemy, but then he tells 
he tells her or fools her when she says, what is, you know, what gives you your strength? And he says, oh, well, if you bind me up with this twine and, and so on, um, then I'll lose all my strength. And so she does that while he's sleeping and then says, the Philistines are upon you, Samson. And he just breaks them, of course. And somehow doesn't seem to realize that each time she says, um, you know, tell me the secret of your strength, she is actually not on his side. <laughs> so it does it again. And then the third time, even more stupidly, he tells her the real reason or the real way in which he will lose his strength, which is, oh, if you cut my hair, look, you know, he, he feels sorry for her for some reason. So love can be so blind, can't it? Anyway, uh, Samson, Samson has his hair cut. The, the, he loses his strength because he has broken his vow. God has departed from him. And he is taken prisoner and they gouge out his eyes. They, they weren't very nice about anything in those days. And uh, Samson has one last go when they're brought out to a feast and the, the building is full of Philistines, thousands of them. And uh, in his blindness, he asks to be put next to the pillars that are supporting the balcony. And he uh, get re his hair has grown again. And he he uh, regains his strength and he pushes the, the pillars down. The thing collapses and it says that he killed more Philistines, more of the enemy in his death than he did in his lifetime. And his lifetime was pretty considerable too. So the story of Samson, thorn in his parents' side, and a bit of a lad, and yet somehow God used him, nevertheless. God uses sometimes the most unlikely people. When you look back through history, you think people like Jacob. Uh, you think about the Israelites, they're constantly complaining. You think about Samson, who uh, apparently wasn't very bright, and, uh, and didn't think very much of the vows at one time, and yet somehow comes to his senses and God is able to use him as a deliverer. So these, there are about 13 I think, or maybe more, of the judges, and they reign, or they lead the people, they don't reign, they lead the people at various times. But there's a refrain that goes through Judges, and that is that um, at that time there was no king in Israel. It's a constant repeating refrain. At that time there was no king in Israel, and everybody did what was right in their own eyes. That was it, individualism, autonomy. That is the mantra of today. Everybody does what is right in their own eyes. Everybody does what they think is okay. Everybody is an individual. And so this is the, uh, the way people behave. And uh, it's all been done before. And you see the horrific results in Judges. Towards the end of Judges, after the, we read about all these, <coughs> these different Judges, you have the story of Micah, uh, not the prophet, uh, the, the book, but um, Micah, a, uh, just an individual who takes a Levite into his home. The Danites, who are looking for a territory, come along and take the Levite off him. There's a bit about that. You realize the Danites are pretty awful people too, uh, from the tribe of Dan. And uh, you also hear the story then of the Levite and his concubine. And uh, they are attacked by the Benjaminites. And uh, the concubine is raped. The Levite himself seems to have very little care for her. Um, he simply takes her and drags her away and uh, um, and eventually, and then she's dead, and he cuts her up and sends the parts to the tribes of Israel, and saying, "Look what's happened. This is the way the Benjamites have, have behaved towards me." The tribes are pretty horrified by it, and they do come together and they fight against the Benjamites, Benjamites and uh, they are routed. And yet, then they say, "Well, the Benjamites are part of Israel." We've got to do something for them. They, they actually uh, take wives from another unsuspecting group of fairly innocent people, and they take wives from this group to give to the Benjamin Knights. <coughs> uh, and so it goes on. 
you know, and you've got this, this terrible behavior, this terrible, life was so dangerous in those <coughs> days. You, you were not safe during this time, of this, this period of history, these hundreds of years of history. And it just went on and on and round and round. And uh, time and time again, you see the, the time of judges where everybody did what was right in their own eyes is a time of chaos. Chaos has returned and the sin which beset the world earlier on is being repeated in this microcosm of, uh, of Israel and the tribes without a real leader who were not acknowledging God as their leader. As you get towards the, the end of Judges, you also realize that there were still some bright spots there. You know that lovely little story of Ruth. It's around about the same time. And if I can just refer back to this map back here. Ruth was a Moabites. Ruth lives here in this area. And you've got the story of Naomi. Naomi marries and has two sons. Life is getting pretty difficult in Bethlehem where they live. And they move from there and they go to the land of Moab where uh, things are a little better. There's uh, a bit more rain and uh, things are looking a bit brighter. So they go to Moab. And in Moab everything goes wrong. Naomi's husband dies and uh, the two boys, their two boys have married two Moabite women. One is Orpah and the other is Ruth. But not only does the husband of Naomi die but also her two sons die. So these three women are left without a husband, and as you probably realize, that widows in those days, widows and orphans in those days, were the most vulnerable people in society. That you, if you didn't have a working person in the family uh, who could work to, uh, to, to do the land or to, uh, to bring in an income, then you were really hard up. Naomi thinks that she will return to Bethlehem. She will go back to her own land. And Orpah and Ruth say that they will go with her. And Naomi says, what's the good of you coming with me? I'm not going to have any more sons. And even if I did, um, you know, you'd have to be waiting around for them to grow up. So uh, go back, go back to Moab. Well, Orpah does go back. But Ruth says uh, those wonderful words that um, I'm going to go with you. Uh, your people will be my people and your God will be my God. Wherever you go, I will go. And she stays with Naomi, and they go back to Bethlehem. And it is there, of course, that um, Naomi tells Ruth to go out and to glean from the fields. That was one of the laws, by the way. So it shows that the law that came in there was much better than the, most of the stuff that was around at the time. These laws were good laws that were given uh, to Moses. Anyway, she's gleaning the fields just picking up the bits that drop after the harvesters go through. She, uh, she is noticed by the owner of the field, Boaz. And Boaz um, finds out who she is. I think he fancied her. <laughs> um, anyway, Naomi finds out that uh, Ruth has an extra amount of food because Boaz has said to the workers, drop a little bit more where Ruth is. And um, she comes back with a whole pile of, uh, of grain at the end of the day, more than she normally would. And Naomi says, where have you been? I said, oh, in Boaz's field. Oh, Boaz, she said. Um, he's a relative. So this is what you've got to do. And uh, I'll let you read the rest of it. You probably already, some of you will already know the story. But she lies at the feet of Boaz one night, and she finishes up. Um, she almost actually proposes to Boaz in the act of doing that, but uh, Boaz checks that nobody else has a greater claim than him. He is a kinsman redeemer, as they call him. Uh, he has a, 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 a responsibility as a relative to look after Ruth, 
but uh, if he finds that somebody else has a greater responsibility, he checks with them, they're not interested, so he and Ruth get married. And they have a child, and the child is called Obed. And Obed has a boy, and his name is Jesse. And Jesse has a number of boys, but one of them is particularly important, and his name is David. David. And David becomes the greatest king of Israel, and also the ancestor of Jesus Christ. And the city that they live in is, the town they live in is Bethlehem. And Bethlehem, of course, is the city of David, and it's the city where Jesus will be born later. So there they are. Let's take it just a little further. Because from David, from their uh, Ruth, we go into the book of Samuel. And in 1 Samuel, or 1 or 2 Samuel, you see the story of Samuel himself. Um, Eli is the priest. Uh, Hannah uh, is childless. She comes to the tabernacle, which is at Shiloh, and uh, she wants to have a child, so she is praying. Eli sees her. He thinks she's drunk because she's not praying out loud. It was an unusual thing if you don't speak out loud or pray out loud, or even reading out loud is a fairly, fairly recent thing, actually, in our history. Reading out loud. People didn't read to themselves at one time. Um, so. The fact that she was praying without, without speaking, um, he thought she was drunk. But she says to him, no, I'm not drunk. And uh, she said, I'm desiring a child. And Eli said, go on your way, you'll have a child. The child is Samuel, and she dedica dedicates him to God and brings him to the tabernacle to work with Eli, uh, even as a child. Samuel hears, hears a voice speaking to him one night. And Samuel, Samuel. He runs into Eli, thinks that uh, Eli's calling him. Eli says, go back to bed, it wasn't me. Again, the voice comes. Again, he runs into Eli. Eli says the same thing. On the third time, Eli says, realizes what's going on, that God is speaking to Samuel, and says, what you've got to say when you hear the voice, say, speak, Lord, for your servant hears, is hearing. And uh, Samuel does that. God speaks to him, tells him what's going to happen, that... Uh, Eli's sons are going to die because they have been, uh, they have been corrupt and uh, they've been working against the priesthood. Eli was the, if you like, the spiritual leader of Israel at this time. Anyway, uh, they go out to war. The sons go out to war and um, the ark is taken with them because they're not winning against the Philistines. They take the Ark of the Covenant with them, um, presumably the priests carry it, and the Ark is captured by the Philistines. Woo! Uh, and the two sons are killed. And the messenger comes back to Eli. Eli is sitting by the side of the road and um, says, what's, what's going on? He can hardly see at this time. And they tell him that uh, your, your sons are dead and the Ark of the Covenant has been captured. And it says, when he heard, not that his sons had died, but the Ark had been captured, he uh, fell off his chair because he was of great weight. He broke his neck and died. And so the, uh, the ascendancy to that position of priest passes over to Samuel. Samuel becomes the priest. And in a sense, Samuel is a prophet because God speaks to him directly. He's also a priest. He's a priest, but he's also like a king. Now, he isn't a king, but he's certainly a leader under God. And in a sense, he's very like the designations we give to Jesus. Jesus was a prophet, a priest, and a king. He also, in a sense, um, Samuel in that king position is the last of the judges. He's not designated as a judge, it doesn't come into the book of judges, but he is 
in a sense, the spiritual leader and the last of the judges, a charismatic uh, person, one who was held in great awe by people. You saw Samuel coming, you were shook in your boots because you didn't know whether he'd come bringing good news or bad. So uh, you, uh, you were very careful. But then, during under the reign of, um, of Samuel, um, the people want to have a king. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, the prophecy of what God gave to Abraham was that kings will come from you. So it wasn't unexpected. And if the king followed the way of God, then all would be right. If the king didn't, then all would be wrong. Uh, so it wasn't the fact that it was a king. What the problem was that they would have wanted a king just like the other nations. So they wanted to step out from under God. Samuel is really upset by this because he wants to see um, people uh, being governed by God himself. So anyway, God says, give them a king. So God anoints Saul as the first king. Saul goes out to battle against the Philistines. And one of the reasons was that because the Philistines had metal weapons, they also had chariots. They used them down on the plains. But the metal weapons were a great advantage over the Israelites. If the Israelites wanted any, any metal work doing, they had to go down to the Philistines to get it done. They didn't have metal workers. So Saul um, was able to then to bring people together, to bring the tribes together, and to fight against the Philistines. But one day he goes out to fight. The instructions have been from Samuel that he's to, to completely wipe out uh, the army that he's fighting against. Uh, and all the cattle and everything to get rid of them all. Um, at the end of the battle, uh, Samuel seems to be delayed. Saul uh, makes the sacrifice himself, uh, what only, only the priest could do. And uh, when Samuel arrives, he finds the sacrifice is already done. And he says, didn't I say that, or didn't God say that you were to destroy everything? He said, oh yes, we did, we did. What, why can I hear cattle lowing in the distance and, and sheep uh, barring? Um, and Saul says, well, I was only keeping that to, for a Thanksgiving sacrifice. And Saul says, to obey is better than sacrifice. To obey is better than sacrifice. And he says, Saul, because you're disobedient, uh, God is going to take the kingship away from you get the monarchy away from you. You see who's really in charge, can't you? Saul might be the king, but Samuel is dictating the terms, and it is God who's talking to Samuel. There's still a theocracy under God, uh, even with the king there. So Samuel goes out, he anoints someone else. Well before this person is going to take over, he anoints David. That's all the sons of Jesse before him. Eventually, uh, after he's gone through all the rest, God says, none of those um, said, you might think that they're the right ones, but God doesn't judge by outward appearances. He judges by the heart. And David is the one who has the heart for God. And it is David who then comes in. Saul anoints him as the king, but he doesn't take over the kingship. Because then you get the story of David and Goliath. David goes to the camp to take food to his brothers. Goliath is challenging Israel in the, from the Philistine camp, saying, send out your best man, we'll have a fight. The one who wins, wins the whole battle. And uh, Goliath is denigrating the God of Israel. And David is horrified that no one's doing anything about it. And they say, okay, will you go? So he says, all right, I will. And they take him to Saul. And David is only a young, little young guy. Samuel, uh, I made a, a paper uh, thing of Samuel once, of, uh, of Goliath once. It's about three bricks. I think it came to about three or four bricks below the top of the window there. So he's a big guy. And uh, for, the, for the video, um, probably uh, three, three, bricks, three bricks above the, um, above the doorway there. So 
Goliath's a big fellow. And uh, Goliath sees this little fellow coming out towards him. David couldn't even uh, wear Saul's armor. It was too big for him, too heavy for him. He goes out, he takes this, the, uh, the stones and uh, puts them in a sling and it's like a bullet. He lets go of the sling and it hits Goliath in the forehead. Despite all of his armor, it's his weak spot and kills him stone dead. David cuts off his head and takes it back to Saul. The battle is won that day against the Philistines and David finishes up becoming a general in Saul's army. Saul then becomes jealous of David and uh, Saul tries to kill David. And this is the story of David's covenant with Jonathan and uh, how he makes a covenant with Jonathan, blood brother covenant. Uh, it involves all sorts of things, you can read about that. And David it becomes basically an outlaw. On a couple of occasions he has an opportunity to kill Saul, but he will not take the opportunity to kill. He is waiting for God to work out his purposes, and he is waiting for God's timing. He will not take the life of God's anointed. And we're going to leave it there. I'll recap a little bit about David uh, next time and then we'll carry on and show how that story develops. Let's pray for a moment. <clears throat> Lord, we thank you that even through desperate times, even through the worst times, that you teach us lessons about the chaos that results when we turn away from you, but also of the blessings that accrue as we follow you, as we listen to you, and the order that you bring to our lives and the blessing you bring to the lives of others. We thank you that you incorporate into your plans uh, even the most unlikely people in the unlikely times. We thank you that you're always at work. We pray that you will work in our lives, that we may be your people in your place and certainly under your rule and your, your providence. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.